laughing in uh, at the first reading because I I love Jonah. He's such a drama queen, and I <laughs> <laughs> it just resonates with me. So well. I, it's so bad I just want to die. <laughs> can't help but laugh. I mean, yeah. um, Nancy asked for an update from uh, Tyson House. So for those who don't know me, I'm the chaplain. My name is RJ Powell. I'm the chaplain at the campus ministry at UT, Tyson House. And um, many of you also know that we are in the midst of a possible building transition. And um, we don't know exactly what that means. So yeah. there's no real update other than um, the cathedral ruins are building. It's looking at possible uh, buyers. Um, we are, as a ministry, working more closely with the Wesley Foundation, which is the Methodist ministry just up the hill. So we're doing a lot of like cooperative stuff with them this year. We may rent some space from them if, in the event that we lose our building. We've also heard that there, we might stay in the building. We have no idea. So please pray for us. Um, <laughs> some days I do feel like Jonah is like, just let me die. <laughs> Other days, Jesus is like, wake up, you're all right. <laughs> sort of like our, um, our gospel lesson today, I think whenever we hear Jesus say, the kingdom of heaven is like, you better put your seatbelt on, <laughs> because we're about to go for a ride, whether we like it or not, into a different world, in which we will certainly be surprised by what we hear about this kingdom of heaven, because it is not like we would expect things to be, or even perhaps even want things to be. Today, Jesus invites us to imagine a world that isn't driven by the notion of scarcity, where there is enough stuff for everyone, where, there, where we don't just have to get what's mine, my stuff, what I deserve, my rights, we often live in a manner that shows we re what we really believe in the world is a world of limited resources, as if there wasn't already enough for everyone. This notion of scarcity thinking spills over into pretty much all areas of our life, if we really look at it. How can I get the best deal? Who is the winner and who is the loser? Who is right? And who is wrong? Who is in and who is out? Who's on my team? And are you on my team? Or are you my enemy? Pretty soon we are wrapped up into this kind of bad guys and good guys, the ins and the outs, this dualistic thinking, right? Positive or negative. There's nothing in between. It's dualistic thinking of always having to compete always thinking that there isn't enough for me and also for them. Mm -hmm. And so we circle the wagons. We, we are the ones who determine who is in and who is out, who is right and who is wrong, who is friend and who is enemy, who is worthy and who is not. We quickly appoint ourselves as both judge and jury. But perhaps these are not the right questions to be asking. Perhaps our sense of scarcity, our tendency to compare ourselves, is one of the things that Jesus came to challenge. In our Gospel lesson today, Jesus told the parable, the story of the laborers in the vineyard, where there's a vineyard owner and he hires day workers to work in his vineyard. Some of the workers work from sunrise to sunset, and some only work an hour. At the end of the day, everyone got paid the same daily wage, a denarius. You might have remember that from last week's uh, readings. Denarius is basically one day's wage, a wage that they all agreed to be paid when they were hired whenever they were hired throughout the day. We might sympathize with those who worked all day long in the heat, from sunrise to sunset, and they got paid the exact same thing as the ones who only worked for an hour at the end of the day. We 
naturally feel that there's something unfair, that there's some injustice that has been performed. Yet, what was the injustice exactly? They were paid exactly what they agreed to be paid when they were hired. The generosity of the landowner toward the one who worked few out, the ones who worked fewer hours, feels like injustice because we compare ourselves. It is in the comparison is the that we feel the clash between justice and mercy. Comparison. But why do we feel this way? Why do the workers who labor all day feel that they are entitled to more pay than those who only labor a few hours, even though they had already agreed to the wage that they were to be paid? Just before Jesus told this story, he had an encounter with a wealthy young man who had come to him and asked how he could inherit eternal life. Jesus could see that this rich young man felt entitled to the good life because he was both wealthy, which at the time was perhaps a sign that you have God's favor if you were wealthy, and he was religiously pious in his Jewish practice. So Jesus told him that he should sell all of his possessions and give them to the poor. Only then would he be able to receive what he asked, eternal life, as a gift. Not something that he could buy with money or attain by good works. The eternal life that Jesus offers is rooted in this concept in the Torah called tikkun olam. And it's in a sense of eternal life in which the totality of the individual and the family and the community, and the nation, and the world, you see those layers? <laughs> that they are all contained in harmony, balance, justice, and healing. This is the eternal life that Jesus is talking about and promised. The rich young man, his sense of entitlement, Wanting the good stuff, the good life, apart from anyone else, is what was keeping him from inheriting that which he sought. The young man walked away in sadness because he was not willing to give up his privilege. All the while, the disciples were watching this happen, right? And they thought that since they had left everything to come and follow Jesus, that something that this rich young man was not willing to do, that they were entitled <laughs> to inherit the kingdom. First, we have entitlement from the rich guy. Now we have entitlement from the <laughs> disciples who gave it all up to follow Jesus. Entitlement. A sense of entitlement. Entitlement that they should have what others do not or should not. And that is the problem for both. They are both like the workers in the vineyard who thought that since they had worked all day, that they should be paid more than they had already been, that they had already agreed to be paid. By comparing themselves to others, they believe that they deserve more. This brilliant parable cut right through the heart of their motivations and ours, if we're really honest. And it does so by demonstrating that any sense of entitlement completely misses the point of the kingdom that Jesus was announcing. Completely misses the point. The kingdom of heaven, in this kingdom, there is only one who is entitled. There is only one who is worthy of praise. There is only one who is the rightful judge. And that one, though he was in the form of God, did not regard equality with God as something to be exploited, but emptied himself. This is how we see God expressing and showing himself to us in the person of Jesus. In the kingdom of heaven, no one is entitled because everything is given as a gift. This is the meaning of grace. 
At the end of the day, all the workers are paid what they had agreed to be paid. Comparing ourselves to others only creates an illusion that blocks our openness to receiving the gift, the grace that is offered to us. When, can we, uh, when we can only accept the gift that Jesus offers, then we will know that we cannot possibly be entitled to it. It is our practice here to come to this communion table every week. And it is here, at this table, that we are invited to come as God's guests to a meal, to a banquet. It is here in bread and in wine that we are given God's very self in the body of Christ, broken and poured out for you and for all as a complete gift of love for you. You cannot earn it. It is given. It is pure gift. That is why we receive it and don't take it, right? <laughs> it is not just for us. It is for all. God has prepared a place at the table for everyone, for everyone born. <clears throat> this is the good news. The vineyard owner said, take what belongs to you. All that we are and all that we have is gift. We did not earn our life. We did not earn the air that we breathe. We did not earn the love that we share with one another. When we finally realize this fundamental truth, that all of life is a gift, when we finally realize that we belong to each other, when we realize that there is only one who is entitled to the credit, and that that one decided to give it all up for us, perhaps then we will realize that the polarizing questions that divide us from each other are the wrong questions. Who is right and who is wrong? is diffused, is eliminated by relinquishing our entitlement, foregoing the insistence on what is rightfully ours, and learning to pour out our lives for the sake of others. This is the way of the kingdom that Jesus taught us. It is the way of the cross. As St. Francis taught us, it is in giving that we receive it is in pardoning that we are pardoned, and it is in dying that we are born to eternal life. Or as Paul, St. Paul wrote in our lesson this morning, living is Christ, and dying 